Welcome, everyone, and thanks for spending a little time with us today. I want to especially thank uh, Jim for coming along. Jim is the most knowledgeable guy I know in the state of Vermont about things like hemlock willow adelgid hem elongate hemlock scale and how that's going to affect hemlock going forward. So I really appreciate him being here and helping me out with questions and answers related to those. Um, we don't have a lot of time here. So I'm going to dive right in. Uh, we're going to start off with some basic tree ID stuff, and then we're going to switch and talk about some of the important or unique characteristics that make these trees special. We're going to talk about what the models, climate change models, say about the future of these trees. And then <clears throat> we're going to talk about what you can do to help them. So starting out with tree ID, uh, hemlock's pretty easy to identify. The first thing we look at is often the bark. Um, hemlock bark is light brown, has kind of deep furrows. The only thing that's sort of like it that's also a conifer is white pine, but uh, as you can see, the pine bark is usually much darker and it's also thicker. Um, if you're trying to uh, make sure that you're looking at hemlock. One thing you can do is sort of shave off a little bit of the outer bark. And if you see that beautiful purple highlight underneath, then you know you're looking at a hemlock. Um, when we look at the needles, hemlock is often uh, confused with bal uh, balsam fir. <clears throat> um, they both have short, soft, flat needles with two white stripes underneath. One of the differences is in the length. So hemlock needles are generally about a half an inch in length, whereas the balsam fir is usually closer to an inch. It can be as small as a half an inch, but they're usually a little bit longer. And if you're still unsure, um, a surefire way to tell the difference between the two species is to look at the way they are attached to the twig. So if you see, uh, look on the right there, the balsam fir the needles are attached directly to the twig by what look like little suction cups at the bottom of the needles. And on the hemlock on the left there, you see that they have these sort of <clears throat> soft, fleshy stems that attach the needles to the twigs. And if you're doing a hemlock woolly adelgid survey, that's where you're going to look for those little buggers. They're going to be on the underside of the twig, right where those needles attach uh, to the twig. Uh, and if that you're still confused, you're still unsure, you can always just crush the two and they'll quickly, pretty quickly tell you which one is balsam fir. Uh, moving on to red maple, the best way to tell the difference between those at this time of year is to look at the buds. So looking at the red maple on the left, they're round, they're sort of clustered, and like a lot of things associated with this tree, they are red. Um, Norway maple on the right also has a rounded bud, but that is a much stouter bud. And although it is red, it's really more of a maroon. Another difference is that the bud scales overlap. And the sugar maple buds are very different. They're brown and pointed and a little bit hairy. And I want to take a minute here to thank Caitlin Cusack, these red maple uh, so these maple slides were borrowed from a PowerPoint presentation that she helped put together that we all did. The uh, forestry team have done three of these now. So if you want to bone up on your tree ID skills, you can go to our YouTube page and find the recordings for those three events. Um, but I just stole her PowerPoint slides and slipped them in here. So thank you, Caitlin, for that. Uh, another thing to look at is the bark um, this time of year. These are, these are younger trees. So sugar maple on the, in the middle there um, has a little bit more texture than the red maple on the left. The red maple are, is pretty smooth, uh, light gray, and starting to break up into those sort of narrow, thin scales. Uh, the sugar maple, like I said, is a little more gnarled and it sometimes has this sort of cracked old paint look to it. Norway maple also has very smooth bark, but you can see these sort of long longitudinal lines uh, starting to break it up and those have an orange tint to them. So that's a, a hint that you're looking at 
and Norway maple. This next slide shows the same three species a little later in life. And you can see those vertical strips much more pronounced on the red maples, um, pretty flaky. Uh, sugar maples will also have sort of long vertical strips or plates of bark, but those are much thicker and they are held by those trees much more tightly. You're gonna struggle to get that sugar maple bark off, whereas the, the strips of red maple will flake off relatively easily. And the Norway maple, you see that bark is very, very much changed. Their uh, ridges have developed uh, around those, those longitudinal lines that we were looking at before, and it started to create a bit of a diamond-shaped pattern, sim very similar uh, to white ash. Now let's talk about uh, some of the things that make these trees unique. And we're going to start out with hemlock. Um, <clears throat> and probably the most unique thing about hemlock is that it grows for such a long time. It is the longest lived tree in our woods, with the exception of the black gums that grow in the southern part of the state. Um, it typically grows four to 500 years and has been known to grow to almost 1,000 years old. And so when you start to talk about carbon sequestration and storage, hemlock can be a really important species for that. It may be growing kind of slowly because it's often in a very crowded situation in pure hemlock stands, but they're usually pretty big trees. So the sequestering or drawing in of carbon may, may be slow, but they're putting on a lot of carbon because they are so big and they're storing it for a really long time, which we all know is really important. <clears throat> so because of the way that it grows and, and its ability to grow in very deep shade, uh, and sort of control the, the environment around it, it's able to create both landscape scale and local diversity within our forests. You think about um, the, the matrix northern hardwood forest, uh, that is broken up by pure hemlock stands in some areas, especially along streams and steep slopes down to streams on north facing slopes. Um, and then you see <clears throat> occasional hemlock trees uh, popping up in northern hardwood stands and creating a little bit of a different habitat within those larger northern hardwood stands. Or if there are a few of them, they transition to what we would call a mixed wood stand, mixed softwood and hardwood. And uh, that's an important, uh, important wildlife habitat function for hemlock. Um, because of its ability uh, to grow in deep shade, it can, um, or because of its deep shade, it sort of controls uh, the water availability. Um, and how it does that is in, is obviously the deep shade keeps the water, um, keeps the sun from getting in so the water isn't coming out of the soil quite so quickly. And it's also, it shuts down its transpiration in the summertime. So it's not drawing as much water up out of the soil. So there's sometimes a little bit more water in uh, areas with a lot of hemlock. So the water table and the streams may have a little bit more water in them. Um, <clears throat> and we all know how critical it is to those wooded streams, that deep shade, um, keeping the temperature down and the uh, roots stabilizing the banks of the stream. Um, the water temperature, nice and cold, keeps the invertebrate populations up. There's more invertebrates there and there's a bigger diversity of them in streams that have hemlock along their banks. And with those invertebrates come um, vertebrates, especially uh, brook trouts. Brook trout are three times more likely to be found in streams that have hemlock along their banks. Um, another sort of interesting thing about water regulation with hemlock is in the winter, fall and winter, when the, when the hardwoods are shut down, the hemlocks are still growing. Anytime that there's water available and it's warm enough for them to access that water and there's some sunlight, they will be growing. So areas with a lot of hemlock the water table will lower a little bit. So there's a chance that flood events with, in places with a lot of hemlock will be not quite as bad. Um, and then there's the, 
the wood itself. Um, if you are doing a construction project, building a shed or a barn or something, I really encourage you to buy your wood locally. Hemlock is such a great wood for those kinds of construction projects. Great for framing and subfloors and sheathing and that sort of thing. It's also relatively cheap. Um, so if you've got a project like that uh, going on, look for hemlock to, and uh, I built my house out of it. It's, it's great wood. And the other thing um, is sort of the, the magic of a hemlock stand, right? There's the, whenever we walk into it, we sort of know that we're walking into someplace really different. It's like the redwoods out on the West Coast. It's, it gets very quiet, it gets dark, it gets cool. It's a very different sort of magical place to be in. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we can expect as a result of climate change. So if we were just talking about temperature and rainfall and that sort of thing, hemlock would probably do okay. Most of the models show that it would be staying about the same in some instances. It might be doing a little bit worse in others. It might be doing a little bit better than it is now, but overall it would probably be, be okay. But the two complicating factors here are hemlock woolly adelgid, on the top and elongate hemlock scale on the bottom. And <clears throat> these two invasive exotic pests have the, the ability to eliminate hemlock on our landscape. So it's really important that we pay attention to these, find out where they are and try to control them um, as best we can. Uh, one thing that can control hemlock woolly adelgid is really cold winters. So winters where we have uh, temperatures below zero, <clears throat> excuse me, for days on end, and it struggles to get up to zero during the day, those kinds of winters can knock the population of hemlock woolly adelgid back 90% or more. But we're just not having those kinds of winters anymore. So, um, the, the population is expanding. Um, one thing that we've seen anecdotal evidence of is that the really hot temperatures during the summer, so like the heat wave that we had last, last August, may be having a detrimental effect on hemlock woolly adelgid. At this point, it is anecdotal. We're not exactly sure whether it's, it's true. So there, there is some research being done to, to investigate this. We need to decide we need to figure out whether it actually is having an effect on them, and if so, how much of an effect, and whether it might actually help control them. Um, <clears throat> I think, so one of the things um, that, that would be, one of the things that could be the result of hemlock being eliminated from our from our woods is a collapse of everything that we talked about in the previous slide. <clears throat> so hemlock is what we call a foundational species. The way that a hemlock stand evolves, it creates conditions under which pretty much the only tree that can grow and survive is hemlock. And it also creates a suite of physical and climatic conditions that create a unique environment for a unique set of species that can thrive there. For instance, there are some warblers that are very closely associated with hemlocks. If you remove hemlock from that ecosystem, you take that foundation away, everything else crashes in on it. There isn't another species that can take over hemlock's role and recreate that natural community. Um, so that's that would be pretty catastrophic for our woods. Um, in these places where we have dense hemlock, if we are, if we do lose it, um, it's likely to transition to some variant of a northern hardwood community. On drier sites where there's a few hemlocks mixed in with hardwoods um, <clears throat> or where it's a mixed wood stand where those drop out uh, other more tolerant species, probably red maple in many instances, will be the tree that takes over for hemlock. So switching over and looking at some of the unique characteristics 
for red maple. Uh, who doesn't love the amazing red fall foliage of a red maple, especially early in the season when they, uh, the ones in the swamps are bright red and set off against the green of the forest behind. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's got beautiful lumber. It's not quite as hard as sugar maple, but it's, it's plenty durable. We've got it on the stair treads at home and it's been there for 30 years and it's just as solid as it was when we put it in. It's also, if you buy it local, you're going to probably get it a little cheaper than you would sugar maple. If you buy it at a big store, it'll probably all just be mixed together as maple at the higher price. So buy local. Um, and the most unique thing about it is it's a generalist. It can grow just about anywhere in any kinds of growing conditions and soils. Um, the U.S. Forest Service has been doing uh, what they call um, FIA plots, where these are plots that they visit every few years to analyze the forest and see what kinds of trees are growing there and what concentration and that sort of thing. And one thing that they uh, tested probably 10 or 15 years ago was whether this anecdotal evidence that red maple was expanding its range and was more abundant in our forests was actually true. And so they looked at the data going back to 1941, and they found that in every state where red maple was present, it had expanded its range and become more abundant. So that is a, a really unique characteristic for this tree. Um, it's, a, it's a favorite of browsers like deer and moose. <clears throat> um, and when it's got in seedling form, smaller browsers like rabbits will will chew on the, the branches and the buds. Um, for moose in the springtime, the bark of red maple can be an important food source. Moose only have front teeth on their lower jaws, so they'll jam those teeth in down low and then strip up and take the bark off. Once they get a piece that's big enough so that it hits their back molars, they can chomp down and rip it off. And that inner bark early in the spring has a lot of nutrients and water coming up from the roots. So it's an important food source, for, can be an important food source for them. Um, another important food source early in the spring is the pollen. Uh, red maple put on a lot of flowers most years and they're one of the first flowers to open. So they're an important source, uh, early source of food for pollinators. And of course, last but not least in Vermont, Sugaring, uh, it can be used and is used for sugaring, even though the uh, sugar content is a little bit lower than that of sugar maple. Um, so what do we expect with climate change for red maple? I would say it's probably going to pretty much keep on keeping on. It's going to continue to expand and become more abundant in our forests. And as other things like sugar maple and perhaps yellow birch start to drop out of our northern hardwood forest, red maple is likely to replace them. And what that means, especially in the case of sugar maple, is perhaps a little less thrifty forest. So sugar maple is really good at compartmentalizing insect and disease. Uh, so um, they can survive those kinds of, of pathogens red maple is not as good at compartmentalizing and is a little less thrifty. So there may be some sort of structural changes to the northern hardwood forest as some of the thriftier trees drop out and red maple replaces them. And in places like we talked about before where hemlock drops out, I think it's very likely that red maple will fill those places within mixed wood stands and uh, take over will lose that um, coniferous uh, crown and the wildlife habitat associated with that. But <clears throat> this has been a bit of a bummer of a talk so far. So let's talk about some things that you can do to help. Um, and one of the things is think about doing in, in a sort of uh, integrative pest management approach to controlling hemlock woolly adelgid. And what that means is using a bunch of different techniques to try to control the insect. The first thing you need to do though is decide where you're going to treat, what, what trees are you going to treat? And 
there is a tool that has been developed by the state of Vermont. We will include a link to that in the follow-up resources that we send you in an email. Um, and that will help you think about where are areas where high value hemlocks are growing on your property. So high value hemlocks, we're talking about healthy hemlocks growing on a good site that provides some sort of value. So maybe it's an important deer yard, or maybe it's a steep north facing slope down to a stream, or maybe it's like this hemlock stand that you see on the screen here that's um, a, on a fairly flat area, but is adjacent to a stream and is providing that really important shade. Those are all high value stands that you might wanna consider treating either with a chemical treatment. Um, the most common chemical used is imidacloprid. It's a neonic, which uh, will people will probably recognize can be a problem or is a problem for pollinator species. The research that has been done, and Jim can correct me if, on this if I'm wrong, but the research that's been done shows that it's not as much of an issue when used with hemlock because Hemlock is a wind pollinated tree. So insects are not visiting the flowers of hemlocks uh, to pollinate them. So it shouldn't be an issue. Um, if you, another way to treat them, uh, which I found out when I was doing research for this webinar is to do a light silvicultural treatment or a light harvest. And the, but the critical word there is light. Because if you thin hemlock too hard, you take too much out, you will shock the stand and you're likely to end up losing all the trees. So hire a consulting forester to help you with this if you don't already have one. If you need one and you don't have one, give one of the VLT foresters a call and we can help you find one. But if you do a light thinning in the winter to protect the roots, there is some evidence that you will keep the hemlock lily adelgid population down and you will significantly improve the growth rates of those hemlocks. <clears throat> the hemlock lily adelgid really don't like direct sun and maybe that's why they're always growing on the underside of hemlock twigs. So if you increase the amount of sun reaching the foliage of the hemlocks within a stand, you may be able to keep that, that population depressed a little bit. Um, and the other thing that's really important related to hemlock lily adelgid, the health of hemlock, is, um, <clears throat> is knowing where these things are. This is really important. Right now, we know the hemlock lily adelgid is largely in Wyndham County, not in many other places. Jim can help with that if people have questions about where it is in Vermont. The elongate hemlock scale is relatively new to Vermont. If you look at most websites, they don't even recognize that it's here, but it is here. And where they co-occur, where you get both insects on a single tree, it can be pretty devastating. So it's important to know where these two things are together. So if you're out doing a survey looking for hemlock lily adelgid or elongate hemlock scale, and we will also include links on how to do a survey. So you can do a scientific survey, or if you're just out going for a walk and you see that a porcupine has been feeding on a hemlock and there's a bunch of twigs on the ground, start picking them up and looking at them to see if there's anything on the underside of those twigs. If you find something, it's really easy to let people know, because on every page of vtinvasives.org, there's a little button that says report it. It's a white button with red letters. And if you click on that, you can fill out a form to tell the folks there what you have found. It'd be great if you included a photograph and a GPS point or some sort of a description of where you found it so that they can map it and we can keep track of where it is. Um, if you're out looking, for hemlock woolly adelgid, new infestations are often found by water, so look there. But they're also found places, because the adelgid doesn't move itself, it's moved by other things like squirrels and birds and that sort of thing. So uh, you might look along <clears throat> edges of fields and roads and that sort of thing, or in your backyard, places where birds will be perching in the sun. Um, and the last thing on this slide, if you find a light infestation of uh, elongate hemlock scale, taking down the tree may help to slow the spread, but I want to say 
uh, let's take this advice with a grain of salt because we definitely don't want to go the way of the chestnut and the white ash or the ash in the Midwest and eliminate all the trees in hopes of uh, stymieing the insect. So um, yeah, if you have a, a little bit of EHS that you found on a hemlock that's not very valuable, you could cut that down and, and hope that you've slowed the spread in that area, but let's not do this more widely. And it looks like I've been going on for quite a while. So let's uh, reserve a little time for the Q&A and I'll turn it over to Maya so she can do the closing slide and then we'll do some questions. Great, thanks, Peter, um, for this great presentation. Really quickly, um, you can see here that this webinar is the first in a four-part series of we're calling Tree Talk Tuesdays. Um, David will be leading the next one on February 14th, and you can sign up for all of the future installments in this series on our website now, blt.org slash events. We also have a great webinar coming up about wildflowers in winter, and um, We'll also be having two in-person tree ID walks to complement this online series. Those are not on our website yet, but if that is of interest to you, um, you can put it on your calendar now, March 11th in Barrie and March 26th in Burlington. Um, so we'll be sharing more information about those soon. Um, when you leave this webinar, you'll also see a survey pop up on your computer, and we would love to um, have you fill out that survey and hear um, your thoughts on this event. Um, and now I will turn it over to David to answer a few questions. Um, and, and because we are coming right up on 1230, um, we'll probably stay on a few minutes um, after 1230 to get to a few of these questions. So um, feel free to drop off if you need to, but if you can stay, um, we'll get to some of your questions. So David, take it away. Great, thanks, Maya. Um, real quick, not a, not a bunch of questions. Um, we'll start with an easy one. Um, do maple species hybridize? Um, uh, not that I'm aware. Do you think they do you know of hybridization, David? <clears throat> the only the only two I've heard of, I know in the labs they've done some stuff, and I have heard silver maple and red maple because they flower almost at the same time. Huh, but I don't know, Jim, if you've heard anything about like sugar or red or anything like that. Um <clears throat> no, I have not. Okay. Yeah, I think it's all the timing of when they're flowering and that kind of stuff. Um, so interesting, we had a couple of trees, uh, I mean, a couple of questions about um, hemlocks that are snapping off, breaking about halfway up the tree. One was on a um, south facing slope and um, actually the one didn't say, but some of these were good sized trees and wonder if we have any thoughts on that. And they appear to be healthy looking, so. Yeah, it's a little hard to know, not seeing the trees. Um, uh, I guess I need to know a little bit more about the site and what happened around it. Um, if it snapped off part way up, it was probably some sort of an odd uh, wind event that uh, twisted it off and, and broke it. Um, <clears throat> I did find a tree like that near my house uh, last winter after a big rain, uh, excuse me, a big wind storm. It was probably about an 18 inch diameter. Uh, tree and the top had snapped off and planted itself right next to the trunk. So I suspect it was wind. All right. Um, let's see. Um, any special considerations when planting red maples? Uh, I can't think of any. I mean, I think it's pretty much the same as if you're planting any tree, you want to make sure that your hole is a little bit bigger than the roots that you uh, are putting in there. You want to loosen up the soil on the outside of that hole so the roots have an opportunity to get in there um, and make sure you don't mound up a lot, a lot of hemlock bark up high on the tree after you get it into the to the ground, make sure if you are mulching it that you're lightly mulching it. Okay. Um, here's one kind of a question I've seen, you know, related to this on other ones. Um, so someone said they have 10 acres with patches of hemlock and should I be encouraging other species to grow? Um, so it kind of comes in that diversity yeah, I guess I would say it depends a little bit on the other values that those 
uh, hemlocks are providing. If they are <clears throat> um, growing in stands along a stream or they're on a south-facing slope providing deer uh, winter habitat uh, might be something to consider trying to trying to protect or trying to convert into something else in the case of a, something on a south facing slope. Um, do you have thoughts on that, Jim? Um, <clears throat> yeah, very little, uh, I guess, to add, but, but I think your point of, of carefully prioritizing is a really good one. Um, if you have hemlock, even groups of hemlock that are growing, say, on a droughty ridge line, um, you know, that they're not in a good site for hemlock. I would encourage people to concentrate their management efforts on those sites that would be considered good hemlock sites, which are often, you know, uh, cooler, moister uh, sites, riparian zones often. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that's interesting because we just had a question about can you transplant hemlocks? I've heard they're hard to relocate. Um, so kind of right into your your answer there, Jim. Um, yeah, the shallow rooting uh, certainly makes them a little tough to handle, and they're so prone to get shocked as well. Um, mm. You know, I've seen it done. I'm aware of people that have moved hemlocks uh, to create field insectary for the biocontrol uh, beetles that we're we're uh, trying to use here in Vermont. So it, it can be done, but it's uh, it's hard to have a really, really high success rate. Hmm. So um, one of the folks that asked the question about the tree snapping off did say um, it appears that the inside of the trunk or inside looks, um, you know, softer or spongy. So I don't know if that would indicate some kind of internal rot going on yeah may have been growing on a site where you know hemlock can be <clears throat> fairly susceptible to ring shake we can which can start a little bit of rot if it's growing on a steep slope or something like that can start some hard rot for sure uh, another oh good go ahead <clears throat> i say another quick question with the hemlock um sort of you know want some details about light thinning um and those kind of things that have a stand near a stream, but there are many small stunted hemlocks with many needles. Should I take them out? You know, what should I, I should do? Um, of course, my sarcastic answers, find a consulting forester to come out and walk around with you and look at this stuff. But Peter, I wonder if you had any comments on that. No, I think that's the right answer, David. You know, get some advice <laughs> from a professional forester to look right. at it. And some right. of those, you may want to try to create a multi-age stand where you are promoting those younger uh, younger trees, that regeneration, and do some light thinning in the canopy. But it's a little hard to know uh, without seeing the site. But do you have ideas or thoughts on the, on the matter, Jim? Well, my, my only thought came when they mentioned that they were uh, understory trees with a lot of needles on them, um, which just shows how shade tolerant they are. And, and so I wouldn't count out small trees in the understory. They may be extremely old, but they have a great capacity to uh, respond when they're released from those, uh, you know, uh, positions under the main canopy. Uh, so don't, don't count them out. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, Jim. Um, another one's kind of along the slow, same line. So this was about, since hemlock is so long lived, is it, also slow growing question mark if it is slow growing does that make using hemlock lumber less sustainable um i don't know i'm making want me to take a crack at that one um i guess my first reaction is yes it can be very slow growing it's a tree that can be can live a very long time under suppressed conditions meaning a full like a full canopy being very long lived um i I might be wrong on this, but I think it was close to a thousand years is the one uh, sort of the record tree that they think, but typically it's not maturing until it's like three, four or 500 years old. Um, and as Peter made reference that it is a great wood, it's really not considered a valuable lumber tree in the big picture. It's actually more value for like wildlife things. Um, and I don't, 
Peter, I don't know if you saw, I know birds, there's many bird species that use it, um, you know, and then lots of mammals going on there. I think of porcupine and um, snowshoe hare. It's a great um, uh, deer wintering, uh, you know, great deer yards for the hemlock. So um, I don't know, any other comments? Yeah, I think you're right. It is it is um, very slow growing, but at the same time, as Jim alluded to earlier, uh, it has the ability to grow very slowly in very deep shade, but then when it gets access to light, it can grow quite vigorously. And so a light thinning can actually do quite a bit to help it grow more quickly and, and, and be a, a healthier tree in general if it has more access to light. Um, do you have comments you'd like to add, Jim? I don't really have anything significant to add. Yeah. Um, just a few more, then we can probably wrap up. Um, this is a quick, I've seen trees such as magnolia, where I live in mass, respond to mm -hmm. and eradicate scale via their own internally generated chemicals. Has this ever been seen in hemlocks? I, I, I am not aware of that with hemlocks and elongate hemlock scale, uh, no. Okay. Um, since hemlock is wind pollinated, is there a concern about the pesticides being blown into areas where they'll harm pollinators? I'm, I'm really glad uh, someone asked that question. There are several uh, application techniques for uh, the products that are often used against uh, hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale for that matter um, that are um, that are, are not broadcast or airborne deliveries um, and and reduce the exposure both to pollinators but also the exposure to the risk of drift um, there there are several, application techniques that are, are very, uh, you know, tree specific. Uh, you can avoid exposure to nearby plants. Um, you can almost eliminate exposure to pollinators. There are several techniques for application that are um, just, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna say they're safe, but um, eliminate a great deal of exposure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, All right. is, that ad is that adequate? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have four more questions. I don't know. We are quite over time now, so I'm not sure if you want to bang through the rest or. Um, do you have any <laughs> that are specific to things like hemlock willy delgid or, or uh, elongate hemlock scale that Jim can help us out with? Because I really appreciate him taking the time to be here. No, this. actually, actually, one, one was that fellow is going to contact his consulting forester. Um, there's a Freeman maple that was a hybrid between a red and a silver. Um, and then the last two, one is how to prevent deer browsing on young maples. Yeah, so there is a, there's a um, product called plant skid, which is uh, reconstituted pig and or cow blood. It's dried blood that you mix with water and spray on them, and the deer hate the the taste or the smell of it, so it keeps them away. You have to reapply it every couple of months, but they say it works pretty well. And just the last one, since we're <clears throat> just about done, is under current use, will we be able to protect certain stands of trees? Uh, it depends a little bit on the conditions under which those trees are growing. If they are in a unique uh, natural community that falls under the ESTA category, then yes, for sure. Um, but I would say that even within the UVA, regular UVA category, you can do responsible management to protect these species. Sounds good. And All right. We should probably wrap up there. Meyer, you have any? closing statements you'd like to make? I don't think so. Just um, ask again if folks are willing to take our survey. We greatly appreciate um, any feedback that you have about this event. And we hope to see you at um, the next Tree Talk Tuesday on February 14th and have a great day. Thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate you taking the yep. time to be here for this. <laughs>
Thank it was you. a pleasure. All right. Take All care, right. everyone.